Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. hope you had a good break. And oh. we're going to be going now into resurrection. Again, both my talks, the previous one on predestination and resurrection, are full of Bible scriptures. Sometimes the, I might be going so fast through the slides, but just write down the scripture, mm -hmm. you know, and you can go back and, and study it. Mm -hmm. But through the scriptural references, I want you to be confident, you know, right. that this is the word of God. This is revelation from God. Right. We honestly, though, have to understand that sometimes when we take things and we look at them only literally, those literal interpretations or understanding create stumbling blocks, stumbling blocks for us. They can alienate us from the heart of Jesus. Jesus in the Gospels foretells that when the Son of Man comes, he says, will he find faith on earth? Jesus talks about a group of believers going up to the Lord, beseeching the Lord, saying, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name, Lord? Didn't we do all those things, mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I will say to them, be gone from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. We know that 2,000 years ago, as Reverend Jackson was teaching, Jesus comes, but he's not known to those who were supposed to know him. Jesus says to them, are you really children of Abraham? If you were children of Abraham, you would know who I am. What I'm trying to get across is that it's not easy if we just look through our human eyes. It's not easy if we just look literally and take scripture literally. That's right. Jesus said we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. That's right. Because God is of spirit. So let's look at resurrection. Typically, historically, many believers have thought that resurrection happens to deal with bodies long deceased somehow becoming reconstructed, resurrected from physical death to physical life. But what was the beginning? You know, what is the beginning that Jesus will talk about? Let's look at what Jesus says about this. You know, one of the, <clears throat> uh -oh. one of the most amazing but really brief little scriptures that Jesus gives. But it's so powerful because Jesus uses the word in Luke. He uses the word dead twice. One of, one of his followers says, Lord, I want to go with you, but could you have a little break? I just heard that my father died. I want to go back to my village and bury my father. And then I'll come back and I'll follow you, Lord. And Jesus very sternly to the new, you know, follower says to him, let the dead, some versions say, leave the dead. Yeah. Leave the dead to bury the dead. Man. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Were they already releasing the zombie movies in those days? I don't think so. Jesus is not talking about let zombies, let zombies bury zombies, bury dead people. Jesus is looking and saying, these people that are alive, who are going to perform the burial of your father, they are apart from me spiritually. They are apart from the will of God. So Jesus labels them, describes them as dead. It's a metaphor. It's a powerful metaphor coming from Jesus. In effect, Jesus is saying, those who are alive are with me right now. It's true. Because I come to bring life. I am the life giver. In a way, he's already giving us a, a big clue as to what real resurrection is all about, don't you think? Yeah. Because he's saying, let those people who are separate from the will of God, who don't know that I'm on this earth, leave them to bury your father. You stay here and do the will of God with me. Jesus says 
to several churches, but to the church of Sardis. He says in the third chapter, the first verse of Revelation, you have the name of being alive, but you are dead. Jesus is saying the whole people in the church are all dead zombies. They're physically alive, but they're disconnected. They're disconnected from the life source of God. And to the woman, Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Whoa! That's some amazing stuff. Let's look at that. He says, those that believed in me, even though they physically died and they're dead, guess what? They're alive spiritually. And a living person who gets me, who unites with me, they're alive, and guess what? They're never going to die if they stay connected to me. He's not saying they're never going to physically die. He's saying they're never going to die spiritually. So Jesus is constantly talking about spiritual life. Because he's clear about the life that was lost at the fall of man. Paul said there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Right? And, and Reverend Laura Leah spoke about this relationship between our spirit body and our physical body. That our physical body is nourished by sunlight and air that we breathe freely and by elements of water and food that we have to go out and get ourselves. And likewise, <clears throat> when our spirit influences our body to do acts of goodness and deeds of goodness, then those deeds give us vitality elements, which are basically the food and water of our spirit. Our spirit's going to grow. Because if our spirit is taking in God's word and God's truth and love, that is like air and that is like sunlight to our soul and our spirit. So this is how we grow. And both spiritually and physically, we have these senses that she described. But Ecclesiastes shows us clearly that this flesh of mine was ordained from the very beginning to return back to the dust. But my spirit returns to him who formed it and created it, right? Physical death is a natural part of the process. But spiritual death is the result of the human fall. That is the death. That's the death that Jesus says we must be resurrected from, that he is the Lord of resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life, right? He says it before he goes to the cross. I am the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. That's right. I don't have to go to the cross to be the resurrection. I am the resurrection. Because mm -hmm. I am the second Adam, but I'm the Adam who's going who's to achieve victory, and I have achieved victory. Therefore, I am the resurrection. I am the life. You know, the human body was formed of flesh way before the fall. God's ordination that the body eventually decays, that's part of life. Did God suddenly create the spirit world and heaven because we fell? No. No. Our spiritual existence was already ordained by God because God is spirit. And God longs that his object remain with him eternally in relationship. Right? God told Adam and Eve, like it is Revelia said, that on the day that you eat of it, in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Was God lying? No, that was spiritual death. They died spiritually. So spiritual death means we're separate from the love of God. John gets it in 1 John, right? He who does not love his brother abides in death. The wages of sin is death. Carnally minded is death. Spiritually minded is life and peace. We see it over and over again, right? That death has to do with relationship and love and heart. 
If we're in relationship with God and God is love, then what are we going to be full of? Love. Love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're going to be filled with love, filled with life, because God is filled with life. God is filled with love. And if we're apart from God, then we have no life. And it's very hard to love. So we could say spiritual death is the state resulting from sin. It is the state of being separated from the love of God. Jesus called it a state of your heart being hardened. Hardened like stone. And Paul said, whoever does not love remains in death. So then if physical death is not the death caused by the fall, then passing from death to life does not refer to physical resurrection, corporeal resurrection. It does not. It only refers to spiritual resurrection. So, Going from the realm of Satan's dominion, where there's no love, no true love, into God's dominion of life. Isn't that beautiful? We know that we have passed from death to life mm -hmm. because we love the brethren. We love one another. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life and that shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. We go right to the source. Jesus defines resurrection right there. That's right. And we know Paul gets it right here that even though all of us died in Adam, we have a chance for life through the Christ. So there are some biblical verses that seem to appear that appear in the Bible that seem to support the idea of corporeal resurrection that that's the big deal. But let's look at them honestly, right? So it says that <clears throat> at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus there was all kinds of earthquakes and stuff and the dark sky was darkened and then it says the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves, right? <clears throat> and they went into the holy city and they appeared to many. Well, that's interesting. It uses this word appeared and it says to many. Does it say it, they appeared to everybody? No, no. And they appeared. Appeared is a, a word that's used a lot. So let's think about it. If this were a corporeal resurrection, the saints would have appeared to everybody. Everybody would have seen them, right? Like there's this guy going down the street. And you're standing there, and you're standing there, and you go, and Yahweh Kim goes, look, look, and you're looking. I don't see what you're talking about. What do you mean? What do you, I don't see anything. Everybody would see it, right? right. If there was one in this room, would, every, would somebody say they didn't see it? I'd call Oprah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Think about it. If they had appeared to everybody, it would have been instant, instant yeah. conversion. That's right. Romans would have been laying down. There. Everybody would have been running. Ah! Did you see they were walking? You know, they're, they're alive. The saints are alive. It was the Christ. He was the Christ. Oh, my God. You know, right. the instant conversion of all Jerusalem. You know, Josephus, he's a very, very, uh, you know, first century uh, Jewish historian. He make, makes no mention of this phenomena where the whole... Jerusalem just erupted in pandemonium because everybody saw walking dead people. And we have to beg the question, if that kind of resurrection was to eternal life, where are those saints now? If they resurrected back then, 2,000 years ago, where are they now? <laughs> right? And then, of course, let's look real quickly at the, the, the story about Lazarus, about this Lazarus, this Lazarus <clears throat> who, uh, 
who was a friend of Jesus, you know. But Jesus says in there that he's going to perform this. He tells God, I'm going to make this happen because I want the people to believe in you. Jesus said to her, said I not unto you that if you would believe, thou should see the glory of God? So Lazarus' resurrection is a miracle performed by Jesus to help affect people's faith in God. He, he performs a physical resurrection to get to the idea, hey, if my God and I can perform a physical resurrection, guess what we, we came here to do? We came here to, we came here to cut the root of evil. We came here to res resurrect all mankind, which can only be done spiritually. We would have to ask again, where's Lazarus? If that was a resurrection for eternity, where is he walking around? Where's he living? So again, Jesus was providing a miracle, you know, and then let's look at Jesus' description of the spirit world. This is really interesting. Because yeah, it it's not, this is Jesus speaking, you know. <clears throat> and this story is uniquely in the book of Luke, in the 16th chapter. And Jesus tells the story of a very wealthy man. He dressed in purple. Purple was a, uh, the color of royalty. This person's probably royal of some kind. And this guy eats sumptuously. And some people place this beggar. They would do that there. Sometimes the beggars were lame. This beggar has sores all over him so bad that dogs come up and lick him. But the idea is put a beggar outside the gate of a rich man and the rich man will at least let him have some of the crumbs from the table. So Jesus is telling the story. And Jesus says that this beggar dies, and angels take him to the bosom of Abraham, which for Jews, that was the dream, mm -hmm. that you would reside in the bosom of Abraham forever, because right. Abraham is the father of our faith, mm -hmm. right? Then the rich man dies. Well. The rich man dies. And the rich man, he, where does he end up? He goes to hell. He's in this tormented place. He describes it as being so hot. And looking up into the spirit world, he sees Lazarus, the beggar. Oh my God, the beggar with all the sores on him. He doesn't have them anymore, but he's up there with Abraham. And he calls over to Lazarus. He calls to Lazarus, Lazarus, could you please just come down here and just dip your finger in a little bit of water and put it on my tongue? I just need something to help me with the, it's just terrible down here. The torment is terrible in hell. And Abraham says to him, this is according to Jesus, that there's this gulf fixed between the two realms of the spirit world. So that Lazarus, he can't just come down to your area of the spirit world and do what you want him to do. There's a gulf fixed between. Am I on the right verse? Maybe one more here. Yeah, there's, beside this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. There's this big separation. Oh, gosh, the, so the wealthy man freaking out, goes, what's next, what's next? Okay, if he can't come here, if he can't come to my part of the spirit world, send him back to earth. Send him back to my brothers and have him appear to my brothers. <laughs> and scare my brothers into changing the way they live. Actually, his heart is a good heart. You know, the wealthy man doesn't want his brothers to befall the same, you know, destiny as himself. Right. So he says, please, please send Lazarus to go to my brothers. And Abraham says, your brothers have Moses and the prophets. They can hear their words. Uh, you know, of course, the, Moses and the prophets are dead, but they can hear their words alive in the scriptures, in the scrolls that are read out loud in the synagogue, Right? 
But he says to him, no, Father Abraham, please, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. My brothers will repent if they meet a spirit from the other side. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This is this phrase is a phrase of Jesus. The one should rise from the dead. Jesus is talking about another kind of resurrection where a spirit from the spirit world would rise from that position and come to the earth and perform a providence of trying to help awaken someone. But basically, Abraham is telling telling, uh, the wealthy man, wait, even if Lazarus went to your brothers, they've got the word of God with Moses and the prophets. They're probably not going to pay any attention to him. Even, right? right? Even if he were to go, even if he rose from the dead. So Jesus is describing a phenomena where a spirit from the spirit world appears to people on the earth, right? To help them perform a providential task. So let's look. We talked about the, that resurrection is the same as the providence of recreation, right? So therefore, <clears throat> the principles of resurrection also operate on, the, I mean, resurrection also operates according to certain principles. There are four principles. The first is that just like in the principle of creation, how do we as human beings achieve, right? Our completeness and our oneness, it's with the word of God, mm-hmm. right? Hearing the word of God and acting on the word of God, practicing the word of God, right? Obedience to the word of God. And in our physical self, right? Remember we saw that diagram of the spirit body and the physical body? Right? It's only through my physical body, my physical life of doing the works of God, doing good works, that my spirit grows, that my spirit receives vitality elements, and I'm able to grow spiritually. I receive God's word and truth, right, from the word of God, and I act upon it, and I receive vitality, growth in my spirit, right? So the same thing, for resurrection to occur, it's going to be on the base of a physical living person like Jesus was alluding to, that, being, that a spirit would come to a living person and work with them. We'll see it also in Paul's words in Hebrews. And that there is a certain merit of the age, right? We live in a time right now, right, where we have the words of Jesus to guide us. We have the words of Moses to guide us, right? But there were ages in the past when people didn't have such words. So the age in which you're born, you're born with the merit of that age. We can even see it on a physical level, right? That our kids right now, right, they don't have to run and look for a payphone. They have cell phones. They have their own individual things, you know. <clears throat> There's a certain merit of the age, the benefit of the age in which they live. And finally, also that just as in our, in creation, creation, right, has a, a, a process of growth, in, in creation. And so in creation, we grow from formation through growth and completion. The same thing spiritually, that resurrection takes place on three stages, a form spirit, life spirit, and a divine spirit. So let's look at the three stages in the providence of resurrection for people on earth, right? So Adam and Eve were growing, but they fell at the top of the growth stage. And they fell so low, they fell below the level of creation, of their value. So what did they offer to God? They would offer animals and plants and things like that, things from creation that did not sin, that did not disobey the word of God. They had disobeyed the word of God. They threw the word of God away, right? They threw their connection of heart and relationship with God away, and they, they forgot who they were and became the children of Satan. So in the providence of resurrection, It would take almost 2,000 years for Abraham's family to come and to achieve a foundation to receive the word of God. And by the word of God, then finally there could be resurrection, right? Because we need to receive the word and act on the word to actually be resurrected, to start the process of resurrection. So 
people of the Old Testament age who lived by the word of God, who lived by the Mosaic truth and law, they were able to grow to a spiritual level called the form spirit level. You know, and people who lived in the time of Jesus through the New Testament and applied his word in their life and lived it, they were able to grow to the life spirit level. And finally, when the Lord of the second advent comes at this time of the second coming, when he brings that complete truth that we've been talking about, which we believe is now and here, then people on earth at this time, standing on the foundation of the Old Testament age, standing on the foundation of the New Testament age, can receive the completed Testament age truth and become people who achieve a divine spirit level. Amen. 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 So <clears throat> let's look at Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So Jesus is coming to realize a world without sin, where we can be free of sin. First Peter says, we are kept by the power of God through faith until the time of salvation, ready to be revealed in the last days. Right? And in Acts 3.21, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. We can see that God is sending Christ, sending the second advent of the Christ to complete the work of salvation. And, and Paul says it, that all those saints, having obtained a good report through their faith of the Old Testament age, right? Right? He says that they received, a, they received not the promise of God, but they can receive it with, by working through us. That's right. Right. And, and he talked about, I love this quote from Paul, you know, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, Right? You know, that when, when that which is perfect comes, then that which in part will be done away with. We won't see in parts anymore. We'll see the big picture. Right. You know, yes. when I was a child, I spoke as a child. Yep. Right? I behaved as a child. But now, when Christ can tell us plainly of the Father, we've got to put away those childish things and really be true sons of God and daughters of God. Yep. Right? Right? We see right now through a glass dimly, but then... We will see clearly. Hallelujah. Christ is coming to complete the work of salvation. And that requires a full, complete resurrection. So the spiritual phenomena manifest at the sign of the last days. You know, God says he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. You know, but actually, I love this quote here in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. And one star is different from any other star in its glory, you know? So is the resurrection of the dead. There's different levels of the resurrection of the dead. Right? And, and, and John warned us that we should, you know, try spirits. If, if God is going to pour out a spirit on all flesh, then we should also try the spirit, right? Whether they are of God. But that also, actually, that idea that we have to try the spirits, you know, that we have to really seek for the truth, means that it's not going to come in a big, obvious way. As Jesus says, when the, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? We're going to have to work to see it. So just real quickly, to sum, summarize everything, <clears throat> the saints of the Old Testament age, they could come and assist the time of Jesus, and help the people of Jesus' time receive the gospel of Jesus, then they could be resurrected together with the New Testament saints. Old Testament saints could be resurrected with them to a level of being life spirits. And when the Lord of the Second Advent comes, at his second coming, then both the New Testament saints and Old Testament saints can come and work on the earthly plane in returning resurrection to help us believers at this time See who the Messiah is. See who the, the, the man is, the man of God is, and be resurrected yeah. into the divine spirit level. So, from the spirit world, on the individual level, a, a divine spirit comes and works, or a heavenly spirit comes and works with the spirit of a living person. That living person's spirit affects the, the body and gets the body to act according to that will. 
and therefore grows the spirit. And this spirit actually grows together with this spirit. This spirit is actually using the body of this living person to grow spiritually. Do you get it? Did I go too fast? No. Yes. So through this cooperation, that's what, what Paul means, right? Those Old Testament saints, they did not receive their reward, but with us, they can. Yeah. Because if they work with us and help us do the will of God, act upon Jesus' words, then as we bring the kingdom, they are resurrected into the kingdom as well. And ultimately, we can see this create the unity of religions. That when the Messiah comes, when the Lord of the Second Advent comes, then returning resurrection, the spirits of the different, various different faiths, they will come and they will seek common bases with with ardent Buddhists, with very faithful Confucians, with very faithful Jews and Christians. These returning New Testament saints will come and do returning resurrection work to revive the spirit of Christians. This is their spirit self and their physical self. The spirits only have a spirit self. But they need this, this person here to get going, to act upon it, so that that body can create the vitality elements of doing God's will and return those vitality elements, not to only to that individual, but to the spirit that's able to move them and, and guide them so that they can receive their reward together with us. Yeah. Right? And what was Jesus' final prayer? Jesus' final prayer in John 17, 20, 21. I pray, neither do I pray for these alone, these Christians, these my faithful believers right here. I don't just pray for them. He says, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus sees something happening that those that he has with them will give a word and others will believe in him through them. I pray that all may be one. Father, as you and I are one, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So the unity of religions will reveal to us the Lord of the second advent. Thank you everyone for being so attentive during this time. Thank you so much. I look forward to the next time we're together. God bless.